So mammals are going to be our uh, final group of animals that we look at um, before we move on to, to other topics. So kind of backtracking, you know, so who or, or what, you know, are mammals. So they are chordates. So they belong to this phylum, the chordata. They belong to the subphylum vertebrata. Okay, so they have cranium uh, and a vertebrae. Right? They have uh, axial skeleton, the, the cranium and vertebrae, and they have an appendicular skeleton. They have a shoulder girdle and a, a pelvic girdle, same as lizards and reptiles, and, and similar in many ways to uh, the amphibians you know, as well. Uh, they share a lot of the, the same features. So now we continue to move on. Vertebrates are going to be amniotes. which is what we looked at last with birds and reptiles. They are amniotes and they lay eggs. Now, mammals can lay eggs. So we do have a group called monotremes. They're the egg layers, uh, like a duck-billed platypus. Right? Lays an egg and it's a mammal. Right? Why is it a mammal? We'll go over you know, the specific features of it being a mammal. So for example, hair. Mammals have hair. Talk a little bit about the structure of hair. The reptiles have scales, the birds have feathers. Right? You don't have birds with hair, or reptiles with hair, or uh, mammals with scales. Um, these uh, characteristics are specific for those groups. We have marsupials. Who have a pouch. Um, and then we have the eutherians. Who are placental. And in the uh, the last talk where I looked at the egg structure, I did a little bit of comparison showing that the, the same many of the same structures. There's still the the amniotic sac with amniotic fluid. There's still a chorion, uh, and then the structure that would be the allantois uh, and yolk sac then get uh, modified so that the nutrients then come from the mother, uh, and then the embryonic tissues and the maternal tissues kind of interact uh, with the uterine wall and placenta. So uh, these give essentially live birth. From the mother versus the, the egg layer. So and they're a little more, like I said, more rare in the group, but they're, they're still in the group. So we can't say all mammals have live birth because some don't, but the majority do. So you might see that somewhere. Right. So they're, they're tetra, they're chordates, they are tetrapods, um, they are amniotes, uh, and now we're looking at the specialized sort of features that they have. For each of the different groups to try to point out something in particular, uh, instead of just going over just total anatomy uh, of all the bones and, and sorts of structures, and then just kind of repeating them for groups, we're kind of pointing out some things that are unique for some of the specific groups. And so in this particular group, in the chordates, um, all right, sorry, in this group of mammals, all right, what we're going to look at are teeth. teeth and feeding strategy because typically the tooth structure of a mammal uh, really indicates what its primary diet is and or should be um, and, and that's what they're adapted for. Now all mammals have uh, certain groups of teeth. Now some of them might lose one of these groups but they have incisors canines, premolars, and molars. So typically the incisors are up front here. We have incisors here in this group, but they're just in the lower jaw. We don't have any upper incisors. And they're incisors here. These are the front teeth. Uh, usually they are for more pulling on tissue. So uh, in herbivores, this might be used to uh, pull plants from the ground or pull leaves off of trees and kind of break any connections that they have with a stem right? so that they can kind of get through that. You'll notice that typically there are you know, no canines here. Right? And so what are the canines? Well, interesting here, you know, these sharp teeth that you're used to. Humans also have 
canines not as pronounced. Um, so primates generally ha do have canines. And in a predator, the canines are going to be really large. So the predators have the incisors. The predators have the canines, but they have very large canines, whereas the herbivores, no canines. It's because they're typically used for tearing uh, into meat uh, of a prey organism, and herbivores don't, don't do that, right? They really need to kind of pick the plant material and then grind it up, okay? And then so that's what we have going on with these other teeth. So we kind of have premolars, which are tend to end slightly uh, more pointed, and then the molars, which are more flattened, uh, and these are for grinding food. We have those here, here, you know, and here, especially. So depending on the group, okay, and you're going to see different. Some teeth missing, some teeth uh, more well developed. Now, an omnivore is going to have uh, a fairly equal representation of all different types of teeth, right? So, animals uh, like humans, primates, they feed on plant material, or they feed on fruits, they feed on meat, right? So, they eat a whole variety of different types of food and they're adapted for that. You know, organisms that are strictly vegetarians, say, or herbivores. They, they lack the teeth necessary for tearing into meat and chewing it. They have very then well-developed molars for grinding the plant material. Right? Humans do have molars for grinding plant material, but not as well-developed as the herbivores. The other thing we get into is, we don't, don't have in here, is parts of the digestive tract. It's much more difficult to break down the plant material, and actually humans can't even break down the cellulose uh, in a lot of the plant material. But many of the herbivores can, right? They have uh, bacteria that live in their guts that can break down the cellulose in the plant material, and they have extra sections to their gut so that they can then digest and break down and get nutrients from that food. Although you'll notice as well, in terms of uh, feeding strategy and um, behavior, herbivores are feeding all the time. They're just constantly feeding because they're really not getting that much nutrients from that plant material. So they have to just feed and feed and feed. They're awake. They're, they're, they're feeding most of the time. Right? Predators, you know, just they're not feeding most of the time. I mean, they're a lot of times they're sleeping, right? Because they get a lot of food from their uh, meat uh, and then they rest, you know, for the rest of the time. Omnivores kind of have a little bit of both. So they can kind of be eating more fruits and vegetables, uh, and nuts and things like that. They could eat, mix some meat into the diet. They don't really have really well developed Canines are usually not used for attack, but they can tear into some uh, material. And again, usually it's not for attacking or killing prey. That's typically not the case. It's more just for consuming uh, meat that's captured another way. So uh, as primates you know, evolved, they became more intelligent and used tools and things so they can, can actually capture um, their prey and they don't need to just bite the prey to take it down like uh, a predator, like a wolf, right? That has to chase down an organism and then bite it and injure it and, and kill it, right? The omnivores typically don't do that, um, at least not, not for the most part. And so the teeth tell a story of the type of feeding strategy that the organism generally has, and it will also often reflect parts of its digestive system as well, what it can even digest. So it can eat a variety of different things. You could feed different organisms anything, but they may not be able to even digest it because they're just not adapted to do that. Right? So uh, we, we belong to the omnivore group, so we can kind of do a little bit of everything and really should do a little bit of everything to be most healthy um, because that's kind of what we're adapted for. Um, whereas the herbivores don't eat meat at all because they they don't you know, have the, the system for doing that. They don't have the teeth to even grind it up or pull it apart. Something else about the teeth, and this is a particularly important uh, feature. My marker ran out there. So I'll re-highlight this. Although I don't know if that's uh, look much better. Diphodont. So di means two, all right? Don't uh, tooth, all right? And so two. Here we go. Sets. Two sets of teeth, right? Baby teeth. 
that we lose them and then we get our adult teeth and most mammals do that as well they all have they have a first set of teeth that come in often sometimes called milk teeth and then they lose them and then they gain their adult teeth that's generally the case for most of the mammals so they are called diphodonts in terms of um, the cycling of teeth some animals say like a shark just constantly produces teeth all the time they break off teeth that's it um, other animals and, and the types of teeth they have what tissues they are derived from uh, how many sets they have are all sorts of all over the place all variety of different sorts of things so this is the characteristic for mammals right in particular so with that with their diets and, and strategy and feeding strategies and actually being more active in terms of gathering food that will very active to spend a long time to gather plant material for herbivores and omnivores and also um, expending a huge amount of energy often in short bursts for the predators um, they're, they're warm-blooded right, animals right so they have a, have a lot of um, metabolism running all the time so that they can be very 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 active all right so we're not going to go into the, the physiology of that but kind of know these are these are all warm-blooded animals I'll talk about the skulls, skip over the hair for a second, uh, because we brought the skulls up before. So if you remember when we talked about the other group again, we had anapsid skulls, which are the turtles, testudines, the uh, uh, tortoises and turtles. Um, and they have no openings besides their orbits, right, or their eyes. The uh, reptiles and birds all right, were diapsids, and they had these two additional openings. And then we have the um, synapsids, uh, which are the mammals. Okay, so mammals, all mammals, are synapses, so the skull type. So that's a unique feature. So mammals are going to have um, a synapsid skull type with teeth set in their jaws. Uh, now they're going to have two sets of teeth, and then they can have unique variations to the teeth, uh, usually either all or some variation of these particular types of teeth, depending on the feeding strategy. Now they're warm-blooded, and then they're going to have hair. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the skin, you know, and, and the hair and some of the glands. So um, talk, talk about the mammary glands uh, after this. So uh, this is sort of dermis. Here, this would be the epidermis. This is a hair follicle. All right. Here we have a bulb. There, where the sick would call it the you know the root, the hair, uh, which is down in the dermis. Okay, we also have muscle attached then typically to uh, this shaft here, so that the muscle can contract and, and the hair can move. Um, so the hairs start off down deeper in the dermis and then grow out through the epidermis. Typically, they're also associated with um, which some other color here I'll just draw this blob uh, it doesn't really look that different uh, certain certain oil glands are often associated with this so the um, the sebum is secreted along uh, the hair shaft and in addition to that we usually have a variety of cells which you can't really see on here because they're they're cells but they're called melanocytes And the melanocytes are going to create the pigment that can then be deposited within the uh, the hair follicle then as it grows and typically if you were to look at a hair under a microscope you'll find that there are even layers to the hair there's a medulla so there's sort of a, a a layer in the middle of the hair where you find the pigment and then there's outer layers really that are more transparent uh, and uh, and you could if you look at different hairs of different animals under a microscope they're going to look incredibly different uh, than one another so if you look at uh, a cat's hair versus a horse hair versus a human hair incredibly different they, they actually look like they have scales on the outside of the hair and some look incredibly pronounced and and, and some are not so it's not just sort of the smooth uh, little thing that you typically think that you have there uh, it actually has all these little scale like structures on the hair so now the hair is growing now out of the dermis, and it's associated with oil glands. There are here sweat glands in the skin, and this is going to be a major characteristic of mammals. Okay, so I put mammary glands plus. Okay, so there's just a number of uh, glands associated with the skin. So they're usually 
we're not going to go in, you don't have to worry about this for our particular class of so eccrine and apocrine glands, different types of grand, glands that secrete different types of material. So there's more of the, the sweat glands. Um, and then there are the glands that say produce different types of oils and the milk, right? So the mammary gland is really one of these types of glands. It really falls into the same family of glands, say as the sweat glands which is a different type of gland. And this is going to be, obviously, it's where the name of the group comes from, and it's a unique characteristic of all the mammals. So all the mammals, whether they're monotremes or the placental mammals, produce milk. They have mammary glands, right? and the young feed on that milk from the mother. That is an essential part. So uh, whether you're uh, a giraffe or you're a hippopotamus or uh, a gorilla or a little tree shrew or a whale, all mammals, okay, because they all have hair of some sort. Now, some have very long hair. There's different types of hair, which can it's kind of beyond our class. There's so much material, you know, really to cover here. There's typically guard hair that can be on the outside of an animal, and then there's insulation hair. So there's hair like closer to the body that provides warmth of insulation, and then guard hair that can cover the body. Oils can be sec then secreted from these glands on top of those, that, and it can actually waterproof uh, many of the mammals. So like a beaver that swims in the water, same thing like um, the birds who swim, uh, preen, put oil on their feathers to waterproof them. Mammals can also do that as well, especially the mammals associated with water. So they can actually trap then you know, a little layer of air in that insulating hair, the same way the downy feathers sort of do that for birds. So there's a lot of parallels uh, in that. And there's some mammals like us that then, then lose um, most of the hair and still, uh, still have a, a lot of it in different places, but um, majority of it um, is restricted uh, on different areas of the body. Um, in terms of how much it, it actually grows. Um, but the mammary glands are sort of the, the unique feature of the, the group. So that is sort of very important. And that's why I'm bringing it up here is because it's, it's related to these skin glands. Um, if we were to study that in, a, in more detail, and you might study that more in, in uh, probably just an anatomy class or a human anatomy class. And, and that would be the true for all mammals, not just humans. So the, the, when you would study those characteristics and features. We're not going to really go into it with the skull, but they have uh, three all mammals. We're mammals too. They have middle ear bones. There's three particular middle ear bones that we find uh, in the mammals. Uh, we also find a four-chambered heart. Now that's not particularly unique. Right, birds have four-chambered heart, you know, as well. Um, most of the reptiles only have a three-chambered heart. Some of the other um, Chordates and vertebrates only have, say, a two-chambered heart. So there's different different types of arrangements there, um, but all the mammals typically have the, the four-chambered heart. Um, i trying to think what else to really uh, get into with the mammals. I don't know if I have anything else specific that I need to, need to say here. I think I've covered you know, the majority of the main things. So, I mean, there's a lot more to it. So mammals, like I said, are, are broken into these groups based on uh, reproductive strategies. Mammals can be broken into different groups based on their feeding strategies and their ecological role. So as herbivores and predators and, and omnivores and, and, and a variety of others. Um, mammals' nervous systems also are have a wide variety of development um, from being uh, fairly simplistic in, in some of them to being incredibly complex you know, in others. So that has to do with brain development and the nerves and uh, the conduction of impulses as well, which again is a topic you would get into more in just a, a human anatomy physiology, but in a comparative um, vertebrate anatomy or comparative mammalian course, you would really see that there's a, quite a lot of differences in between them uh, and how they kind of control the, the muscles. Um, that's kind of quick. I, I hope um, we covered everything, I think, with this. Uh, and so that's going to be the last group of uh, the animals we go into. And the next step is what we'll start to look at is just uh, populations of animals. So we'll shift into an ecology section um, and look at population ecology and community ecology, different organisms uh, interacting with each other and then, and then ecosystems um, and then biomes to kind of kind of expand, you know, out uh, from smaller groups to to the whole planet. And that's going to be the, the last material we have in our course.